Right, time for another DraftPhysics.com, DebatePhysics.com. What is the nature of debate, uh, conversation, um, discussion? And people just won't do it in a way I think it has to be done. Okay, so that's sort of the problem here. I, I, I mean, I don't know what they think debate is supposed to be. It's just exchanging insults or you know, declarations without any evidence. There doesn't have to be reasoning and counter arguments. And, uh, you know, it just doesn't have any appearance of being at all connected to anything that can be argued. And, you know, this is just an argument about some sort of little physical facts. You just say, okay, I don't accept the existence of that fact. And you provide a reason and some explanation for how you think it happens some other way. <laughs> And they just won't do that. So anyway, the, the silly hero, you know, I don't know what else to call him. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's just a religious kook. Um, but anyway, he pretends to do some of this logic thing now and then. And, um, you know, again, his argumentation was always difficult. Uh, Hoffa Day had a hard time with it, and I did, in terms of, staying on the subject or trying to nail him down uh, and even when you did you know the next day he'd just pretend he didn't say yes I agree that that is probably true and then the next day he just goes back to starting all over again saying well when did you demonstrate that to be true you know that kind of crap so you can't have a discussion with people that vacillate and change the subject and you know do all this crap that's just so unproductive it just makes it impossible to have a rational conversation, in my opinion. You know. So anyway, this commenter, um, I guess I'll start with him and then get to the Puro stuff. Um, just because this is, you know, I can't make any sense of what these people, the, the argument they're making. So he says, all right, I can see why people won't debate you. I mean, it's not that complicated, right? You don't have to have a person debate. You can just make counter-arguments, and you just provide your counter-arguments and show evidence. Now, the Brozo and the Dispar and the Ian Gosling keep doing, you know, kind of what I would just argue are rigged experiments done poorly to attempt to dis establish some sort of truth. And um, the fact is it's not good enough evidence. And it certainly doesn't overwhelm other evidence. Like, again, I could just show in every video... The Mythbusters car crash. Let's just forget their clay experiment, but you know, that sort of does prove the point. But regardless, let's just forget that and just recognize that the car crash in no way demonstrates four times the energy. I mean it's not it's not apparent in any way whatsoever. Fifty miles an hour, one hundred miles an hour. It seems kind of just plainly obvious that the uh, the hundred mile an hour crash is only twice the energy. Only twice the crushing of the car. Uh, and there's lots of little examples like that. And those are what have to be argued through and explained how, well, you know, there's some, that experiment just happened to be coincidentally flawed by some sort of explanation. And then we have these other experiments. But the point is, we don't have any of these other experiments. That's the whole argument here, is you're defending a physics that doesn't defend itself. I mean, in 350 years, they haven't dropped four pounds one foot and one pound four feet and measured how much heat or energy that creates. I mean, it's a pathetic starting point for you to defend a physics that doesn't bother compiling evidence. Again, three, you know, the Eddington experiment. 100 years later, they don't have a better example than um, the Eddington experiment, and it's, you know, it's fundamentally flawed, and they can't deny that the guy said in his journal, I only got 10% of the data quality, and I wouldn't stake my life on these results. I mean, it's clearly not an experiment you, you put on top of the pinnacle and say, look at that. I mean, try to overwhelm, how try to defeat that great experiment. Obviously not a great experiment. Not, so how can I have an argument with people who deny such f absolute truth? You know, it's just an absolute fact that they don't have good evidence and they just, you know, they just keep doing this belligerent, why aren't you believing us? Well, because your evidence sucks. So produce some better evidence. All right, so anyway. All right, then he goes on to say, uh, you don't understand even the basics of what there is to debate, question mark. That's not a question, you fucking retard. So you don't even understand what a question is. You don't understand even the basics. So what's there to debate? Okay, so that's a question. Um... I mean, what, 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 what is that statement? I mean, all of these arguments are about the basics and about 
you know, drawing it, explaining it. Where's your counter theory? You don't have one. You can't draw a charge because, frankly, you have to make it just be magical, right? I have explained it with a mechanical theory that explains how it works. What have you offered? Nothing. I mean, just amazing. I mean, it's just such a, a pointless thing to say, to say somehow I don't understand when I'm playing in my videos physics lectures. How the fuck can you make the argument? I don't understand. I'm playing the fucking lecture, okay? And we're watching it. And I point out something like, well, look at that blob of clay on that air card. I wonder what that's there for. Oh, come on. I mean, you're, this is just such weak gibberish. All right. It's good that people try to find flaws in conventional theories. Well, you're certainly not supporting that at all. <laughs> yeah, so, and you're not fessing up to it. You're not doing anything here but defending really bad science. I mean, it's really bad science to make proclamations when you haven't got any evidence. And to sit there and say that they've well-proven entanglement or well-proven even frames and bent space is just a silly thing to do, frankly. It's silly to say it's well-proven. Uh, but you should first learn what the theories are. So what theory did I fail to state properly, you lying sack of shit? I mean, that's, it's just such, this is just such gibberish. So I did unblock Piero just because he posted his comment on the other channel's shit you know, website board, which is you know, kind of an obscure place to put something. And I can't be sure it's Piero in that context either. Um... You know, you know, but this is the very reason why I had to block him is because you make these kind of statements, these these completely innocuous, like, oh, I'm just going to say some shit, okay, and I'm going to force you to take my seven words and, and you know, expend uh, 4,000 words explaining how, no, that didn't happen, retard. I mean, I have to prove I wasn't at the post office at 7.30 on Friday, you know, in 1962. You know, I mean, fuck you. The box argument. So this is the part that I'm just going to sit here and draw it again. And I'm going to sit there and explain, say, you critics, explain to me where I'm making a mistake. Don't just say it's wrong or just don't say um, some bullshit. Just explain where some statement I made is incorrect. Oh, you fucking pieces of goddamn scum. Anyway. The box argument in this video were so confused. I mean, how could you be confused by this argument? It's so simple. I don't even know where to start. Well, start at the beginning. Start with what exactly confuses you. Oh, Jesus Christ. That you find confusing. Yeah. That's all you're obligated to do. Explain what you find confusing. So the idea is we want to capture the energy of a system. So we want to be able to determine how much energy the system has. And so this easiest way to do it is to put it in a container and then just measure, you know, the fluid level, the pressure level or the whatever. So the idea is, is you're going to make a box. And what you're trying to determine is, is there more of something going one way than the other way? And the truth is the box will tell you. So it's a good measuring device. So we're going to make something happen. We're going to take something that's going to go in a direction. It's going to hit and the box is going to move. All right. And the argument is, is that if I just did one single object, the fact is it's going to hit this way and then it'll bounce this way and it'll bounce that way. And overall, it's going to end up hitting all the surfaces equally and it won't go anywhere. <laughs> now, my counter argument would be is this initial motion will always exist. And so it will it, in tiny little increments creep in the initial energy direction. So the catch is, is that in this Newtonian universe, okay, is that all expansions are basically an atom expands. Or if an electron moves this way and compresses the universe this way, uh, an electron, it expands the universe in the opposite way. It's moving away in the opposite way. So there's always a yin to the yang kind of thing. So any motion or any change in one direction ends up creating a change in the other direction. So this, the argument would be is that if I was to initiate energy in a box, yes, I could shoot something in with a direction, but the more likely way to do it is to create an explosion or an event, and the event will have energy in all directions. And so the box won't go anywhere, 
because there's an equal amount of energy in all directions. And so they all, they all create a vibration, an oscillation. And that oscillation will prevent it from going in one direction versus another direction because you initiated the system with energy in both directions. So Newton is sort of, the Newton's third law is basically a confirmation of that statement. Now we could talk about the third law and I could say that well, a better way to illustrate the third law would be this idea that if I have $10 and I give something $5, okay, I now have $5. So I changed what I have to give somebody else the money. You can't really see that, but whatever. So you can get it. It's kind of simple. It's easy to understand that there's not really an opposite reaction that made me poorer the initial action of me giving away five dollars is all you need to make me five dollars poorer you don't need some counter force all right so anyway so we have the box and i don't think anybody's going to say the box isn't a measuring tool and especially a box in space so we have it in empty space and no gravity no other bullshit to get in the way and so now we're going to do a simple experiment in the box we're going to have an explosion okay so I don't think there's any agreement or confusion that the explosion could be a spring or the explosion could be you know some sort of chemistry uh, where I'm going to cause an expansion and it's going to expand in both directions little particles of shit is going to go this way and little particles of shit is going to go that way and hit things <laughs> okay so the things we're going to put in here are a big thing Okay, so I, I mean, what about this confused this asshole, right? I mean, he says, I made a confused video, that somehow the video was too confusing. I mean, what is confusing here? All right, and so you're going to launch these two things, all right? And you're going to put the explosion at the right distance, so this will be one half the distance that this is. So that way we guarantee they hit the sides at the same time, and that won't make a mess out of our experiment. That is... It won't go one way and then stop, you know, and then readjust. All right. So, um, so you're going to have two things moving because of a force. Now, Newton's third law basically says, well, the force is equal. You know, it's going to do the same thing this way that's going to happen that way. All right. Equal and opposite. And momentum demonstrates that that's exactly the result you get so I don't think anybody disagrees with the experiment it's been done five million times all right that's an exaggeration it's been done hundreds and hundreds of times hundreds of times videoed even okay and this is the outcome you're going to get the half the mass will go twice the velocity uh, the twice the mass will go half the velocity right so the momentums will be dead even mv will equal mv no problems everything seems quite rational and the fact is <laughs> okay so now let's just add this out so so the other the point was is that this guy said I can't collect their energy in this direction without creating some sort of heat or some other dissipation that means the energy didn't go the direction I stated so I just added this simple premise that we just put a spring on each side now I can play the professor Lewin <coughs> video if you insist I can play other physicists saying the same thing, but their theory is, okay, is when this hits a surface that doesn't move, that is if I throw a rubber ball, let's put it up here, I throw a rubber ball at a wall, right? Their argument is that, you know, if this had 20 joules of energy, the fact is I put 40 joules, okay, in here. Um, the fact is, no, it's momentum, sorry. So we'll just go with the momentum. So if the ball has a certain MV, I'll put twice that MV into this mechanism over here. So this will have twice the momentum will be put into the wall, and the ball will bounce back with 100% of what it started with. So their argument is, is this is how they've interpreted Newton's third law. That Newton's third law means if this goes 100 this way, that there has to be a 100 going this way, but you're total has to still be in the same direction so you have to add the other 100 going this way so you need 200 going this way to compensate for the 100 you got this way now obviously my explanation is if the ball bounces back it means no energy went into the anvil or the brick wall all right 
and that they are simple. I mean, I use the simple explanation that if I have a, an anvil, I can bounce a ball, right? And I can bounce it, you know, there's examples of it, 200 times. And it'd be kind of silly to think that each time the ball hit, there's 2x the momentum in this, you know, going this way. Because this would end up being, you know, 40 or 50 times the energy, total energy, would end up being in this surface than I even started with. And that would be free energy. I can't make all that momentum. I can't make any free momentum. I mean, we should be able to agree on that you can't make free momentum. <laughs> you know, come on. But anyway, that's their theory. So I'm just saying, let's use their theory. So what's going to happen when this 5 hits this surface? It's going to put, so it's total, let's just say this total, you know, we could probably do the math, right? Uh, it comes out to 250 you know, 250 joules here, if I use kilograms and meters per second, and this would be 125. Okay, so that's their theory, that this has twice the joules of energy. And so let's say watts, because watts are more, I think watts are more real than a joule, right? I mean, a watt is a real thing. You get that out of a heater, you get that out of things. That's a real measured quantity. Watts comes in, you know, if electricity comes into your house, and it's real shit, it's not some jewel stuff yeah you know come on all right so i have 250 watts is going to hit this surface and the fact that they're saying is is that no i have to double that okay because i'm going to be doubling the amount of momentum that went in um and so essentially i'm going to have um you know 500 watts here all right uh of of energy that goes into this side of the box this surface, this box, collects this 500 watts going this way. And then over here, it collects, you know, 250 watts going that way. All right, and you can understand that, well, it can't go both ways. So what's going to happen is, is this. This 250 will knock this 500 to 250, and this will go with a net, okay, the net 250. Now, there's no way to... There's no way to say that didn't happen by their physics, okay? Their physics, I've been obedient to their theory. And so their theory basically says that this will keep oscillating, okay? Let's say it's in space. We don't have any friction, right? This is all stuff floating. So we have like zero friction. The only thing we have is a little degrade in the spring. So the springs get a little bit hot over time. So we can say we're going to lose a little bit of energy to the springs. But that's the only place we can lose any energy. And so all these, these things will just move right back again. They'll hit the center again. We'll just replace, you know, we'll just replace the explosion. We'll, we'll just start with a compressed spring. So we start with a compressed spring, and the spring is in this location. And now the spring's expanded. The two things will hit, compress it back to the same amount of pressure it started with, and it'll just redo the same thing over and over. And so for each expansion, for each oscillation, each oscillation, I will add, okay, 250 watts more of energy going this way. So it's going to go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. That's, that would be the consequence of obeying their theory. Now, do you think that'll happen? Or are you a reasonable person and you realize, no, these really are the same energy. And this will hit this side and this will hit this side. And Maybe even if there's a tiny millisecond of difference, there'll be a tiny bit of motion this way or a tiny bit of motion this way, but it'll basically stop. Because let's say, let's say I let this one hit sooner. So the 10 hits this springs first. You can understand that, yes, it gives its momentum to the box. Now the box moves in that direction with the amount of momentum exchanged. And now this side hits, and you can figure it out. That yes, this is going to be the same thing. Half the mass moving twice the velocity is going to undo this arrow. It's just going to undo it, and we're going to go back to zero. So we might move a little bit because of the timing issue, but that's the only kind of movement there could be. And like I said, if we figure out the timing to make them hit at the same time, we're going to have an oscillation that's going to be so tiny we won't see it. So again, does, does this guy, Joseph, or Piero, do you think if I took two steel balls and I hold them in my hand and somebody holds a piece of paper and I smash them together, that the paper burns just magically, instantly? Or is what really is going to happen is that those two steel balls, my pressure is going to be constant, pushing them together. 
and those two steel balls are really going to vibrate really quickly. So they really are going to go back and forth and use up all the energy going back and forth. It's going to push this way and then this side is going to push that way and then this side is going to push this way and all the energy is going to be used up in that oscillation. So the box will physically go this way and the box will go this way and the box will go this way and the box will go this way and the box will, you know and it's going to use up all the energy in oscillating and that's where all the energy will go into that oscillation <sighs> all right so again he's saying that this 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 was confused and he, he didn't understand what i'm talking about because i made a confusing drawing that isn't coherent what's in it it's just here's your source of motion you put momentum into two objects the momentum can be converted into a kinetic energy equivalent that is a kinetic energy version of that momentum the kinetic energy version is clearly not the same as the momentum <laughs> all right so and what's the consequence of that um, statement by you that this does in fact have more energy can you prove it so we could do this with a gun and a bullet. You know, I mean, theoretically, the only, the only problem is, is that it gets even harder to collect bullets and get all the energy. So you could argue that you're not going to be able to collect all the momentum from the bullet and the gun recoil will actually make the box move that way. So if I just made a box, floating box, I could take four wires, suspend the box, okay, this way. And we have a gun, shoot a bullet into a ballistic pendulum. All right. And we have all that on the box. What's your prediction? So my prediction is, is no, the gun actually has the momentum. It's actually going to have, it's going to impart more energy this way than the bullet going this way because the bullet's energy is going to start making motion this way and that way because it's going to move the clay or whatever's in the box and it's going to move it in directions that aren't going to be that way and so the gun's going to win and the box is actually going to go the direction of the gun the thing that has 1000 times less energy it's going to go in the direction of the thing that has 1000 times less kinetic energy wouldn't that be a proof? So if we did this experiment outside the space shuttle and it came out exactly the way I just said, all right, so we have a, we have a box, a platform. We have a gun attached to the platform. It fires a bullet into a ballistic pendulum attached to the platform, okay? And if the whole platform moves in the direction of the gun, doesn't that prove the case that the bullet doesn't have a thousand times more energy? because it can't move the box. If it can't move the box, it can't be more energy. It can't be energy. Energy has to move things. If energy doesn't move things, it's not energy. All right. All right, so now on to the Puro bit. All right, I'll pause to find the Puro bit. If I can get my mouse to work. Come on, mouse. Mouse, where are you? There he is. I uh, just thinking that I might have left out the part where I was talking about my theory would be when you bounce a rubber ball against the surface, the surface doesn't move, the ball bounces back. If the surface moves, that is actually you cause the surface to move, the ball bounces back with a lot less <laughs> momentum. So you get less back. So whatever amount this wall moves, the ball doesn't move back. So you can only give, if I throw the ball with 100 momentums, um, all I can do is either put 100 momentums into the movement or it doesn't move and I get 100 back. That's it, there's nothing else. There's no choice where the wall moves with 200 momentums and the ball comes back with 100. That can't happen. And no one's going to show me an experiment where that happens because that can't happen. Okay, yeah. All right, so on to the Piro Cradola. All right, draft Piro here. I think the real difference in the system you propose doesn't come down to exact details. I think it always comes down to some measure of detail. So there has to be 
some detail. Okay, so look, I could make up lots, you know, there's so much of this crap that you really do have to pay attention to, all right? So I can say I can bend light with a gravitational body, all right? But if the gravitational body has a corona, that is, there's a bunch of energy around it, it's really easy to say, well, wait, I could shoot radio waves through that energy and I could scatter it. So, yes, the energy from something right behind, right? I put something right behind the sun and I make it a radio source. Well, the radio goes into the, the energy, the atoms, the ions, all that kind of crap, and it gets scattered. It actually goes to everywhere. So, yeah, you could see it from exactly the opposite point where you're supposed to be blocked by the sun, but you'll see it because it's going everywhere. The lens will spread the radio waves in all directions, the, the scatter. So that's not gravitational bending, okay? So you can't say that it's the same thing, okay? You bent the light. Saying you bent the light, you need more detail than that because you can bend it by hitting something or you have to bend it with this gravitational force. The two events will look the same, but they're not anything like each other. <laughs> okay, they're not comparable. So it's just a lie, okay, to say gravity bends light. Now you can also understand that if you have a gravitational source, most of the stuff <laughs> is going to be going into the source, not out of the source, um, and because it's going to go much slower back than it left. So all the stuff out here isn't going to be moving as fast as the stuff close to the surface. Um, so you can make all kinds of arguments about the direction it's moving and how fast it's moving and how much scatter you get in those directions. So obviously if you're hitting particles that are all moving in one direction and they're causing the scatter that goes in a direction, well, it could look like lensing. It could look like you bent the force, but you didn't bend the force. You hit things that were already moving in that direction and that causes the force to go in that direction. You combine two momentums. So some details are necessary. Okay. Anyway, I mean, it's just... Uh, anyway. Like, do I believe in the two types of force bits? Question mark. Okay, it says, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. But anyway, your push-only system might be able to work with one type of force bit says you. I mean, the whole point is, is that I only spent two years picking at it and picking at it and picking at it and picking at it, trying to make a simulation that would work. And uh, no, it doesn't work with just saying that you don't need the force to be the information carrier. The force has to carry the information. The identity of something is carried by the force. I can't be, you know, I can't have this face to you without the force conveying it to you. The images have to be produced to you by a force, you know, hitting me, bouncing at different places at different frequencies to create this image. So the image is essential and it's in the data of the force itself. All right. So I just want to do this. I mean, just because this, this piece alone, okay, this one thing I'm going to draw <laughs> Should be enough reason for somebody to say, I'm a credible person in the discussion of the nature of physics. Because this is such a simple explanation for something fundamental to all of physics, charge. I mean, to actually be able to explain why electrons and protons behave the way they do is an incredible achievement. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that just because, oh, I did an incredible thing. Fuck me. Say I stole the idea. I don't care. Just recognize the idea is itself something nobody came close to, right? In the whole history of physics, nobody's come close to figuring that period. You know, I mean, look, the whole history of physics is, you know, long before they knew what an electron and proton is. I just mean in all the times that people have been talking about the charge phenomenon, the idea that electrons and protons have this plus and minus or north-south capacity, there's been nothing even close to an explanation for how they radiate their identity, how they show themselves to be these opposites. And I've given you this simple, I mean, so simple, a way that you can make it happen. Okay, so you have the electron and the proton, and this identity thing doesn't really matter, okay? This you could just say, 
protons like hot potatoes, okay? So they love hot potatoes, but a cold potato doesn't mean anything to them. So we could just use hot and cold, okay? And uh, electrons, oh, they love cold potatoes, but they just can't even do anything with a hot potato. It doesn't mean a damn thing to them. And so all you're really saying is, is that I have two kinds of potato, okay? I have a hot potato and I have a cold potato, right? So it could be blue and red. It could be square and triangle. It doesn't matter what difference you use. You're just making the point that these two objects see the force, the stuff moving the speed of light, and they see two kinds, all right? They see the hot potato version and they see the cold potato version, all right? And the simple explanation is, right? I mean, it's so damn simple that if a hot potato hits the hot potato catcher, it catches it, okay? And it's the hot potato's motion, its momentum, becomes this thing's MV, okay? And this thing moves. This thing moves with much less velocity because it's much bigger than this hot potato, all right? And um, if there was already, if it was already moving, say, this direction, you know, with a component in this direction, well, then the two would just reflect. The hot potato would just bounce off of here, and this one would lose a hot potato. So that's not too complicated, right? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go somewhere where you can't figure out what I just said, right? So if I just said two balls can hit each other and do these two things, right? If they're, if they're an opposing force, they'll just bounce off of each other, and it's like they never even hit each other, right? This one goes into this one. This one goes into this one. This one leaves this way. This one leaves this way. Completely inert. Nothing happened. You can't tell whether they hit each other or they miss each other because you have the same exact outcome, and that's what happens to the hot potato, okay, catcher, when it already has a hot potato, okay? It's just like it holds the hot potato, and the other hot potato hits the hot potato, and the two hot potatoes just fly off. So it loses a potato, okay, when there's a reflection. But when it doesn't have any hot potatoes, it catches the hot potato, all right? It doesn't have any going in the opposite direction. And the simple idea would be is that the force can accumulate. You can have more hot potatoes going this way. You could have five or ten of them. And then you can have a hot potato hit here, and this one bounces off. And so you lose one. And then you can pick up another one, and then you can lose one. And then you can pick up four, and then you can lose three. And you can, you know. And that's how electrons and protons move. So the, the hot potato proton <laughs> catches hot potatoes. The cold potato electron catches and holds cold potatoes. And the key difference is, is when a hot potato goes through the cold potato catcher, it comes out a cold potato. All right. And when a cold potato goes into the hot catcher, it comes out a hot potato. All right. And now you have exactly what Maxwell drew. I mean, an exact duplicate of charge exact function, the inverse square law, all of it. You have the whole thing um, with just that simple feature, okay, that the opposite force, the opposite potato, the cold, you know, from the hot to the cold, goes through, is it completely inert to the proton, so the proton can't see the electron force, and the electron can't see the proton force. So obviously, when they're next to each other, I'm running out of substance here, um, so they can't see each other's force, right? You could understand that this one's just making red. So this one just, this is all that can happen is red. Red bounces, red sticks, or blue turns to red. So everything coming out of this object is red. And everything reflecting off of this object is blue. So the only thing coming out of an electron is a cold potato. The only thing coming out of a proton is a hot potato. And obviously they can't see anything when they look at each other. They don't see no potatoes, right? Because it's just hot potatoes. I don't see those. This one's saying I don't see the others. And everything that goes through this one, right? Every bit of potato that goes through here just comes out hot potato. So nothing out here could even see this one. All right. And the simple fact is, is the force is still hitting in both kinds of potatoes are hitting here. So this can't see any red potatoes coming from this direction because the electron turns all the red potatoes into blue potatoes. But it still sees these red potatoes from the other side of the universe. And the blue is doing exactly the opposite. It sees these blue potatoes coming from this side of the universe, but it doesn't see any blues. None of these blues can get to it. So obviously they're pushed together. 
and then the opposite event is when the two protons are looking at each other obviously now every blue potato that comes in from this side of the universe turns into a red potato so lots of reds here every blue potato comes in this way lots of reds more reds made okay so you've converted all the blues into reds and so for that fact alone not only the fact that as soon as they get close to each other they're really going to get intense because of the the reflections so if you try to move them into each other it's all reflected energy right if i already have a pushing force pushing this proton towards this proton i'm going to reflect every potato so obviously they're going to bounce back and forth and it's going to force this potato to start moving in that direction but just the idea of all the blue potatoes, all the cold potatoes that come in from both of these directions are going to be turned into hot potatoes here. And that's going to make this a very high pressure area. And that's why the protons are pulled away from each other. So I've explained to you both why they attract and why they repel. And it's a fundamental part of physics. And I did it in such a simple way. You just have to accept that the force comes in two shapes you know triangle and square or hairy and no hair or you know, whatever bullshit you want to make up are blue and red and that these two things can see the difference between those two kinds of force and they behave differently depending on which one hits them and that simple little thing this simple little two force two kinds of force two kinds of matter okay two kinds of interaction solves one of the greatest mysteries in physics how does charge how does how do you create attraction and repulsion and once you've done this you can explain polarization you can explain dipoles you can explain magnetism you can explain electricity it all comes from this and this is exactly maxwell's drawing again it's exactly the function that Maxwell itemized and formulated um, and it has all of the components it has the inverse square law the point charge aspects all of it is there and this <coughs> jackass wants to tell me okay now he's gonna say you know he just makes this is the part that's just irritating he just says you can okay um, uh, work with <clears throat> so the the push universe thing is another simple idea right so I mean I, I've said it before and these are things like like saying the speed of force I shouldn't have an argument from any of you buttholes that we probably all should say the speed of force because all the forces move the speed of light it's the speed of force gravity magnetism electricity at its best and light it all moves the speed of force all right, and the idea of push versus pull. Again, it's just so obvious to explain what a push would look like. A push would look like this. That's really easy to understand, something pushing on something. Something pulling something is impossible to understand as anything other than magic. What do you mean? This is here, and nothing has to hit it, but it'll just say, I'm going over here. That, you know, can't happen. So you know push is the elemental function. You know that's the real thing that's running the universe, is the concept of push, the concept of from high pressure to low pressure, from pushing pressure to weaker pushing pressure. <sighs> Come on. I shouldn't have to do this. I shouldn't have to do this. These people, like, his Piro isn't this dumb. So he's just being belligerently obnoxious. That's the only thing you can say. Because he's just not stupid enough to say, oh yes, I can say that we can do it with one force. Because I did the experiment. No, he didn't do any experiment. <laughs> you know. All right, anyway. Your push-only system might be able to work with one type of force bit. It won't work with one type of force bit because you actually do have to change it and it, you can't be spin because spin is you know i couldn't i could say look the force spins clockwise it does one thing this force spins counterclockwise it does something else but that doesn't work because one side is clockwise the other side has to be counterclockwise and the two sides won't agree so if a force comes this way it's going to look blue if the force comes this way it's going to look red that's not maxwell's drawings 
that's not in the drawings. The drawing is this is screeting red all the time, this excretes blue all the time, and it can't do anything else. All right, <clears throat> all right, let's see. With one type of force bit and two modes or three types. So you're just saying something. You're just saying, ah, you know, you could do, and I'm saying, no, you can't really do. You're never going to have fewer steps than this. This is, is as simple as it gets. It can't get any simple. I'm just going to tell you, you can't get any simpler than this idea of sending the message. This is the simplest way to send the message is just to make the potato hot or make the potato cold. And that simple switch makes it work. And I, there's just no way to make it simpler. You're not going to make one plus one physics. It's not going to happen because you're not going to be able to make dipoles. All right. These are details. They're not just details. They're fundamental statements about a physical mechanism versus a woo mechanism versus no mechanism. And the point is, again, it's not even like this is at all. Com Look at how complicated all the other models are. Every other model anybody talks about, it's got 900 million elements to it, okay? The glue on, the this, the that, the this, the Higgs boson then does this, and then the strong force does this, and this happens, and that happens. You know, there's so many things, and it's all just some sort of projection. It's all some sort of bullshit. This is as simple as squirrel nut, okay? I mean, it's just that simple. I mean, there's nothing complicated here. All right. And it works. Completely. It doesn't like work incompletely. It works absolutely completely. And in the simulation, I am only doing the two dimensional thing. So just understand I haven't cheated and said, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna impose the second dimension, which would double the force. So just understand I'm only simulating it in two dimensions. If I added the third dimension, that means I'm gonna add a doubling of the pulling force and a doubling of the reflecting force. So the two forces would be doubled if I made the simulation three-dimensional because the inverse square law would kick in. Uh, anyway, those are details. So it's just so, so it's all this belittling, like somehow these details aren't fundamental to what physics should be. This is, this is fundamental to what physics should be, is these details. Okay, the major difference, difference between what? You know, difference from what? The major difference between this actual drawing that works and their non-existent drawing of nothing. You know, it's just some idea that the electron is going out and the proton is sucking in, which doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work physically. It just doesn't work as a mechanism. It won't duplicate actually what does happen because you can't explain the two pushing forces or the two pulling forces being... Uh, repelled. How do I explain that the, both the electrons are, you know, pulling in, okay? And so I put an electron next to an electron. Well, two pulling in things are going to attract. They're not going to repel. So the idea of a force going into one and out of another doesn't work. All right. You don't think that. Let's see. Wait a minute. Okay. There's two major differences it seems to me, is you believe in a universe that has to be intuitive. So you're doing this again. I mean, I've, you've done this over and over. This is one of the reasons I blocked you. I have absolutely zero respect for the word intuition. I've fought against it my whole existence on YouTube. I put a think sign behind me. I've done everything I can to say, fuck, okay, fuck doing any of this book cover shit. All right, you either do the investigation, you have to pick at it, you have to think about it, you have to spend years and years with notebooks full of goddamn drawings. I've never talked about intuition, meaning a motherfucking thing. So you keep lying and throwing this slanderous piece of shit word. I'll just call yours goo goo gaga, you know, head up your ass a wishing. Okay, and that's all you're capable of. I mean, this is such a fucking bullshit. When every fucking video I make is an argument against intuition, any of our human instincts, any of our human emotions, anything that we do reflexively is garbage. And the only value we have is that we have a goddamn fucking brain that can take the time to think about it. Oh, fuck you. 
All right, so I'm not demanding the universe be comfortable or that it works the way I want it to or any of that crap. I'm actually detailing the fact that it's in complete conflict with anything a reasonable person would expect. I mean, I'm against torture. Is the universe against torture? No. <laughs> That's a real conflict. I'm not, it's, I'm not implying, I'm not telling the universe, you have to meet my intuition. No, you have to meet my logic. My logic is, is that torture is bad, okay, and there's no excuse for it and all that kind of crap and it's no good to it and all that shit. And it has nothing to do with forcing an intuition. It's a clear, rational standard. I'm not forcing it to be blue and red. This could be red and this could be blue. I don't give a fuck. So don't talk to me about intuition. It's not part of the conversation. It has nothing to do with any of this argument. It has to do with whether you have secure facts and you have good reasoning. Now the simple fact is, is that a model or a map should look this simple. This, this is what maps are supposed to look like. This is what models are supposed to look like. The Occam's razor principle is perfectly reasonable that if you can explain it with something simple, why would I use a God theory? Or why would I say, God asked Bugs Bunny, and then Bugs Bunny asked Daffy Duck? Why would I add extra elements I don't need? Oh, fuck you. All right. It's laws have to make common sense. No, they have to make sense. All right, they have to be within the boundaries of the observable universe and the and the facts we've gleaned out of it. So again, you are the one who says, I'm not going to be bound by what every bit of evidence says. And instead, I'm going to believe a fable because you enjoy the fable. So you are the phantasmagorical cheater. You are the one saying, my emotional character can't withstand the facts. So I have to bend them into a story, a narrative where I get to be a superhero. Or, you know, where everything turns out okay and the silver lining rays make all the torture go away. Some kind of bullshit fable. You're the one turning the world into a, a, a Goldilocks story or a little Red Riding Hood. I mean, with your childish um, belief in hope and, 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 well, it has to have an enduring purpose and there has to be a reason for it. You're the one with the intuition, the emotional weakness, okay, that you're, sl you're, you're slandering uh, uh, perfectly rational arguments with your emotional weakness. You're whitewashing away what you can't deal with. Ugh, disgusting. All right. I blame the human brain and myself. Huh? Wait, wait a minute. Okay, no, I have to go back to... It's the laws that have to make common sense. So they have to make sense. There's no such common sense as bullshit. So no one's arguing for common sense. Everybody's arguing for precise and well-evidenced um, sense. So I'm saying that, yes, it's well-established what the function of electrons and protons are. And my obligation was to find a mechanism that explains that function. And I have accomplished the task. And that's the fucking truth. All right. I don't think that. So you don't think it has to make sense as to the truth of what you're saying. Because the word common doesn't mean anything. It has to make sense. That is, you can't have gross contradictions in the fundamental laws. The electron isn't a proton. and The proton isn't an electron. There's no reason to believe an electron hides as a proton or puts on a proton mask whenever it's on a Thursday you know, and has a dental appointment or, you know, no, no, none of that, none of that storytelling should be any part of physics. All right. I don't think that, right? So you're just rejecting the rigidity of well-established things that happen over and over and over and over and over and over again. And there's never an exception. The volcano always does this. The, the geyser always does that. There's no example of the dirt magically poofing. Nothing does anything out of what we have decided and, and observed to be its function and what it is capable of doing. Okay, so you're just saying I can make up whatever crap I want to make up as a fable and place that on top of that system and just pretend that we were never looking when the aliens happened to be, you know, flying by. Uh, so when the laws don't seem to make sense or <clears throat> satisfy our intuitions, now you're talking about your intuition, 
And again, this is all just such a bullshit way to have this conversation. Absolutely nothing about what I have been doing for the last 10 years has anything to do with fucking intuition. Every bit of it has to do with me taking a circumstance that happens, an experiment, and then sitting there and spending hours and hours and hours trying to figure out how the mechanism could produce the outcome. What kind of physical mechanism could make that happen? It has nothing to do with intuition. I had no intuition about the nature of a photon. Again, I started with their model. I started with, okay, a photon is this blob, and the blob can be five miles long, or the blob can be the tiniest of Planck's smallness. <laughs> okay, and then the blobs are moving through space. I started with that model. And then I figured out, well, no, I don't need the blob. I just need the distance between. I just need the frequency. So if I just make the, the events, the action, I can explain the, the phenomenon much better. Um, don't need no blobs. Just need a frequency. All right, between events. Well, anyway, I mean, it's just, you know. Ugh. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, and try to understand them better until they do make sense. So that doesn't even make any sense, right? I blame the human brain and myself and try to understand them better, understand what, uh, until they do make sense. So you just force yourself to say, well, somebody said they saw a ghost, so I'm going to try to prove there's ghosts. You know, That's all you're saying to me. You're not saying, well, what I do is go back to the evidence and I, again put all the facts together and then try to make sense out of the facts so I put the fact together that okay well something hits something and twice the momentum goes into the something well okay that's harmless until you start thinking about it and then you say well well that means that the bouncing ball on the anvil is putting 40 or 50 times the energy into the anvil so we should be able to collect that that's like free energy so why don't we collect that? We do one unit of work and we get 500 units of work out. I mean, that seems a, a great idea. Let's capitalize on that. So obviously you say, no, that's a conflict. The laws are broken somewhere here. And the uh, obvious answer is that is a mistake to think that happens because it doesn't happen. Do you believe the world has to make sense? So he says it again. What I believe is, is that um, through experience I know I can't walk through trees and so I have absolutely no expectation that I will ever stick my hand into a tree and the hand will go right through the tree and all that crap zero expectation I have zero reason to contemplate it I have zero reason to think it's possible I have zero reason to waste any of my time on on testing it because it will never happen and it's perfectly reasonable to understand why it will never happen. It's because I know there's matter and I know what the matter is made of these electrons and there's no way I can get my electrons to go through those electrons. So there's no way it can happen. So why would I waste any neurons on it? And so if you tell me that you can walk through trees, I'm going to say, fuck you, you can't. Okay, show me. That's what I'm going to say. Uh, so fuck you. So so again, this this idea that it has to make sense. Of course, it has to make sense. Our whole brain does this every day. We figure out how to do things the most efficient way. People figure out how to do quadruple jump, spinny things in skating. You know, almost impossible physics. You know, they know they figure out how to make the, the human body do all kinds of things, and we watch these extraordinarily silly things that people do uh, instead of cure cancer. But um, regardless, we know that that's what the process is. The process is, is figuring out how, how it works and maximizing this and maximizing that. But there's limits. It's only going to, this is as far as you can go. You can't go any further. You're not going to be able to extract anything more. There's always a, that's it. <laughs> you're done gaining efficiency. You know, once you hit the 100%, well, you're done. You're not going to get it. Well, you can't make it more efficient. So even if we can collect all the photons, right, from the sun, it's only a limited number of photons, so there's no infinite potential for solar panels to, you know, energize the planet. It's just stupid. So, yes, of course, I believe the world has to make sense. Of course. Or I would have to say I'm insane. Because my brain is a sense-making device. That's what it does. It constantly 
balances and puts things in perspective. It figures out bear cub small, mother bear big. It figures out all these differences and it makes perfectly good sense and it makes sense out of the universe in terms of, of making sense out of its function, not making sense out of why it functions or why it even exists. That I can't do. Personally, I think the human brain can make sense of it. So, so again, what, what does that even mean to me? I, I mean, obviously, I think the brain can do it because I've done it. So what are you, why are you preaching to me? <laughs> you know, that this is, I'm saying, look, I figured out the chess strategy. I figured out the way you can make this mechanism. And then once you've made this mechanism, you can explain everything else that happens. Once you understand that these are the things, these are the components the checkerboard is made out of, and it can explain every pattern on the checkerboard. All right, but only with metaphor. So, and again, fuck you. Models work. Um, analogy and metaphor are great. You know, I just used analogy of square versus triangle and hot potato versus cold potato. Those are metaphors, but they're perfectly acceptable. You're just saying it's like that. It's something that simple. And not in the way that will be common sense or intuitive. So I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what the fuck <coughs> sense and intuition have to do with observing something and saying whether it's consistent with everything else that we have observed. So the pool of facts. So yes, if you believe in a uh, ghost and you believe in hobgoblins, then believing in invisible men isn't going to be much of a leap. But if you don't believe in those things and you have a show me attitude, um, and you know how we even work. The fact that, you know, we're, we're expecting extraterrestrials to show up at our door when well, we don't even do that. We send probes first. We don't send people. And why would we think a foreign civilization in some other place of the galaxy would do anything different than to send a camera? Why, why would they send one of themselves? So, I mean, you apply logic to these questions and then you figure out logically that, oh yeah, the odds are... If we're going to see something, it's going to be a probe, not full of aliens. All right, anyway. The two things just evolved to keep us alive and therefore only understand things in our evolutionary history. So what, a, what an insult to intelligence. So obviously, our, the evolution of our intelligence, that is, the evolution of our knowledge base, is the only thing that's really happened. Okay, you take a human being that's uneducated and he might as well just throw his brain in the toilet because it's useless. He's not any smarter than a minky. All right, so let's not pretend our brain is innately intelligent. It has to be educated. And the only way it has any power is through that education. And that's what we have done. And it's a huge leap away from evolution or any notion of being of, of the facts being controlled by a biology. We don't philosophically, we're not biologically having our philosophy. You can't give birth to your philosophy. Okay, that ain't going to happen unless you're a, a, a Muslim or something and you, and you force it. Um, so um, <clears throat> the fact is, is that uh, this is what facts are evolving. The facts are evolving and the conversation is about how should we evolve the facts. Should be under the strict rule of you got to have some evidence, motherfucker. You can't just make your dogmatic claims and say from groupthink, uh, we have authority because uh, we're more than you, uh, you know, in numbers. And so we can tell you God exists, even though we don't have any logic or physical evidence to defend it. Um, or are you going to be a defender of the fact that, yes, physical evidence and facts are all that we have that's useful? And our brain is quite capable of taking a group of facts and finding inconsistencies finding irregularities, finding imbalances, finding things that aren't consistent and fixing them. Our brains can do that. And that's exactly what we all should be saying where our brain should do, is go where the facts lead and quit leading the facts and forcing the experiments and forcing the arguments to go in the direction you want them to go in. So again, the, the fact that you deny that your physics is evidenceless that the pool of evidence for all of your proclamations regarding the truth is empty. Okay, there's nothing in it. You really haven't proven any of these fucking obnoxious claims you make about how the fucking universe works. It's all just fucking bullshit you've made up, all right, and you contrive, you know, these superficial 
you know, very superficial ideas of, of, of even like the gravitational wave bullshit, <laughs> you know, and, you know, so you just make up some fable about how, well, we can convert matter into bent space and that'll make it happen and then we'll have enough energy and then you're just forcing the theory to work. You're not, you're not, you're not being, you're not following the evidence, you know, the simple evidence Einstein gave you that you're not going to see an Einstein ring. I mean, he said it quite logical of him to recognize that gravity isn't a very good lens. It's a, it's bent in all the wrong directions and that you're not going to be able to create much light that actually bends to the location that your specific location. All right. Anyway, I don't want to get into all that. But yes. Fuck you. So all this is mush. Right. That's all he it's, it's all he contributes as much. He doesn't deal with any of these factual arguments about interactions. So he doesn't make a physics argument. He doesn't explain how, for example, I have two radio antennas and I send the signal and the radio signals never interact. They never interfere with each other. And yet I can create the same fringe pattern by just moving the receiving antenna between those two signals. So no. Huygens, no bullshit, okay, where waves interacted with each other and fiddled around. None of that crap happens. Same pattern. I mean, sort of defeating your whole wavy, silly nonsense. Uh, but I won't get any counter arguments. All right. So kind of a long rant video, but I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just so obnoxious. These people aren't arguing any of this physics and they're pretending they can dismiss me and dismiss my arguments with pseudoscience or science denier. Oh, I'm denying all of their facts. You're denying the facts. You're denying Eddington's own statement. You're denying the fact that you haven't done the experiment with any kind of credibility from Earth. You're denying the simple logic of, fuck, we had a 12 noon eclipse and nobody with a real telescope even tried the experiment. And we've been in space for 60 years with 400 times better resolution. And you're telling me it's logical that they've never even tried the experiment. I mean, come on. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make not only common sense, it doesn't make any logical, specific, <laughs> rigorous sense. It makes absolutely zero rational sense, okay, for you to tell me that <clears throat> in the 60 years we've been in space, nobody, it's occurred to no one in the space industry to say, well, you know, we ought to try that Eddington experiment because we have 400 times better resolution. Amazing bullshit. And we don't need an eclipse. And it only takes five minutes. And it only costs $56. I mean, fuck. I mean, just fuck. Fuck you in this bullshit. I mean, this is just such drivel. All right. So, enough of a video. <sighs> yeah, an hour. Well, hmm. But, I mean, look, there's really no point, right? I mean, until the, the character of the people I'm arguing or discussing or even talking to or doing this video to, until that improves, this is just so fucking pointless. And it really is just to the future. I'll just talk to the future and say, look, in the future, maybe somebody can figure out this simple concept. You know, and, and actually accept that the argument is very good. And uh, there isn't really a big giant flaw in the theory. And, uh, you know, and it does explain something nobody else has explained with anything rational except hobgoblins and, uh, you know, Higgs bosons. Uh, you know, the magical Higgs boson. Uh, you know, bullshit. Um, you know, but YouTube makes that impossible. I mean, you, you've, you've created a whole system where, where we can't even make these videos in some sort of honest manner that it all has to be in this stupid propaganda sell advertisement bullshit theater um you know and uh you know where you know the real subject is completely censored i don't even want you know and again google said you know you go to google and you search on something it says 1 million 700 results well if you go to try to see 50 results you can't even see 50. All they do is keep regurgitating the same website. Look at the first top 10 results. Three or five or six of them will be the same fucking website. I mean, they're not showing us the internet. They're shoving uh, their version of the truth down our throats. And you've all accepted this fucking drony society, this Borg. You've just all become Borgers. 
fuck. Gutless, wimpy, apologist for Borgism. You're just fucking embracing your slavery. Ugh, it's disgusting. Slaves in love with slavery. Ugh.